In 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 11, it says this, Get the word out. Teach all of these things. Don't let anyone put you down because you're young. Teach believers with your life. By word, by demeanor, by love, by faith, by integrity. Stay at your post, reading scripture, giving counsel, teaching, and that special gift of ministry that you were given when the leaders of the church laid hands on you and prayed, keep that dusted off and in use. Cultivate these things. Immerse yourself in them. The people will all see you mature right before their eyes. Keep a firm grasp on both your character and your teaching. And don't be diverted. Just keep at it. Both you and those who hear you will experience salvation. Do you ever have that kind of nagging feeling that there's more that you should be doing? You know, the kind of that feeling that there's more to do than there is today? You know, when I think about all the kind of activities that are going on in our lives and I hear somebody talk about balance, then all I really hear is that they mean we should add more plates and kind of keep those spinning in the air. I mean, balance is a bit of an illusion with all the activities that we have going on in our lives with, with you know, everything that the kiddos have to be part of and then we have our jobs and then we got to keep our skills up so we have our trainings and conferences and, and our work and a church and all these things kind of come together. I just realize that there's really more to do than there is today. And when I think about that, I, I came across this term this week called a work martyr. A work martyr. It was a term I've never heard before, a work martyr. And it comes from this overanalyzed group of people, these 21 through 37-year-olds, what we call millennials, right? And uh, uh, okay, we have a few. Did you just cheer for yourselves? So uh, that was pretty awesome. And um, so basically the, this overanalyzed group who we oftentimes are perceived as being lazy or, or detached, they're actually this group of people who, when it comes to work, are not taking their vacation time. They're volunteering for the tasks that no one else wants, that they work more than the rest of us, that they, they stay late, they came in early, and they, they're just really eager to please. But really it's coming from this place of wanting to prove themselves. And that's what we see in this movie, Spider-Man Homecoming, which is finally the return of Spider-Man to the Marvel Universe. And, uh, and I could geek out on this all day, so you can ask me later if you want to know more. But, but basically, this is, this is Spider-Man coming back into the Marvel Universe, this world of the Avengers. So Thor, Hulk, Captain America, and Iron Man. Uh, we finally see Spider-Man getting to interact with them. And in this story, we see a 15-year-old Peter Parker who gets recruited by Iron Man or Tony Stark to be part of a mission which occurred in Civil War, if you want to go and check that out. So uh, we'll put all your Marvel movies in order for you if you're really curious. And um, so you can kind of catch that. But this is his, his movie kind of post that in which, in which Tony brings him back home, says he can keep the suit that he gives him, that kind of this classic Spider-Man suit that, that most of us know of. But he says, go and, and go to your everyday life. Go and be a local hero. Kind of put all that other Avenger stuff, go ahead and just put that on hold. Go and concentrate where you are right now. But of course, Peter thinks he's capable of more. That he wants to prove that he really is capable of being a part of the big leagues. And, and so as he goes about being a, a, a local Spider-Man, he kind of just thinks, you know, I, I could really help out in more ways. And that's the point in which he notices some, some people using some high-tech weapons, and he goes to follow them and to apprehend them. And, and in that process, he meets the big bad of this movie, the vulture. And in that process, the vulture actually drops him in a lake, and Spider-Man needs to be rescued. So I love this paternalistic Tony Stark who, who sees Peter Parker, and he says to him, can't you just be, you know, kind of a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man? Can you just, just kind of concentrate on what is right there in front of you? And that's what I see Paul doing to a young Timothy in this letter in 1 Timothy 4. That Paul is writing to, to a young Timothy who is left in charge of a church in Ephesus. And Paul is writing back to him and, and seemingly reminding him to pay attention to the little things. And, and Paul himself was a bit of a rising star that, as we see Paul, he, he writes in other places that, 
that he came from the right family and that he went to the right schools uh, and, and he was really beginning to make a name for himself, that he was really trying to prove himself. And then when he hears about this group of people who, who claim that Jesus was the Savior, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Paul begins to persecute them and, and begin to say, I'm willing to travel wherever it is to find them and to put them to death and to put down this claim that they're making. But in this process, he encounters Jesus. And then Paul begins to travel around and start churches everywhere he goes. And basically, he would go to a place and he would teach people about Jesus. And as they come to faith and they would begin to worship, then, then Paul would put someone in charge and, and to go to the next place to start a new church to introduce more people to Jesus. And that's the context as he's writing to Timothy. And he's saying to Timothy that I'm not going to become, I'm not going to be able to come back to you as, as quickly as I thought I would. So I wanted to write to you and to encourage you and remind you of some things that, that are most important for you. And in this passage, starting in verse 11, he says this Pay attention to the seemingly small things in your life. Pay attention to those things that are most important. And, and no one will look down on you because you're young or no one will look down on you because you're inexperienced if you will pay attention to these things. And we have this passage up here because the thing that catches my attention the most is he says this, he says, teach believers with your life. Teach the believers with your life. In other words, Paul is saying, remember that people will catch more than what you teach. In other words, that that the life of faith and really most of our life is caught rather than taught. I mean, if you think about this, if you've ever had parents or grandparents who say to you, you know, do as I say, not as I do, and then most of you realized you were like your parents when you said that to your children, right? And then they, they said to you, no, we're just going to do what you do, right? And, and so that's really kind of this idea that, that most of life is caught rather than taught, and so he says to Timothy, here's the things that I want you to pay most attention to. And, and they're right there. The first one is, he says, I want you to live it as an example through your speech, through what you say to other people, through your demeanor, how you act, your attitude, how you carry yourself around other people. The next is, is how you love. Do you really love the people that you encounter? The kind of love that Jesus has for you, do you see them in that way? And the next is, is by your faith, by, by really what, what you believe and, and what you think about ultimate reality and how this world works and how God fits into it and what it all means that live as an example in those things. And then finally he says, live as an example with integrity. Be the same person everywhere you go, whether people are watching or not. There's not different Timothys. Let there just be one Timothy. And that's what everyone sees. And when you do those things, when you guard those things, when you pay attention to those things, it is then that you will teach people with your life. And when I think about this, these are the things that I want the most too. Because Paul goes on to say that if you just keep at it, if you just keep at it, the people will experience salvation as they watch you and imitate you as they, and in other places Paul says, you know, imitate me because the reality is, is that most people will see Jesus in us before they see Jesus on their own. The reality is, is that people are watching all the time. They're looking at our lives and they're saying, what does this person live? What does this person believe? And then when they see it in us, it becomes compelling to them. If you've ever had that moment where you've looked at somebody and you said, that person is an example and I want to know what it is that they're doing. I want to know what it is that they believe. I want to go talk with them. I want to go ask them about it. I want to know what it is that God has done in their life. Because when I see it in them, it's attractive to me. And when I think about the, the people I talk to and they... And maybe you've heard this too, where, where people are kind of maybe offering a criticism of church or they're saying why they're not involved in church and they just say, well, church is just full of hypocrites. And I just say, well, yeah, because we don't get it perfect. We're all on a journey. We're all doing our best. Come and be a hypocrite with us, right? But you just be one of us. 
But I also think in the midst of that, what they're saying is, is I want to see real authenticity anywhere, anywhere in our culture. That is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people who really live what they believe. And I think that's an okay thing to look for. And I think that's what Paul is telling Timothy right now. And what the scripture should be telling us. Because I want this as a parent. I want my children to look at my life and to see me live like Jesus through my speech, demeanor, who I love, the faith that I have, the integrity I have. I want the people that I work with during the week to see that as well. I want the people that, that I'm around and encounter see that in me. And I want them to see that in you too. And I believe that is what the world is truly looking for. So if you've ever thought, well, I, I don't know enough to, to teach or I don't know enough to share my faith with anybody, they're watching you. They're looking at your life. And our lives are communicating so much more than even if we don't have the words. Our love, our faith, our hope is coming through. And that's what they truly want to see anyway. And as we continue in our movie, that's what Tony really wants from Peter. As he really wants him to to begin what it, what it is in terms of this movie, to really what it is to be a hero, to live a life of sacrifice, to really, and to learn that in the everyday life of high school and his life and what that is before he even dreams about going and being a part of the Avengers. But of course, Peter's not really ready for that lesson, and he continues to pursue those criminals until he gets a little bit in over his head and Iron Man has to come in and not even rescue Peter, but some other people along the way. In Luke 16.10, Jesus says this, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. See, Peter desperately wants to prove that he can be an Avenger, right? That he can be in the big leagues, that he can be there with Iron Man. And, and really what Tony wants him to see is who he is inside, that's what he wants him to focus on. That's what he's getting at when he says that if you're nothing without the suit, then you can't have it. He's saying who you are inside will come through no matter what's on the outside, no matter what you surround yourself with. Because Tony is most concerned with Peter's character. And that's what Jesus is getting at too. The most important thing that we can cultivate in our lives is our character our character and our character is simply the way I kind of think about it is it's how we interact with the world it's just simply how we interact with the world all that we are all that we believe our attitudes all those things come out through our character how we interact in the world and sometimes we talk about in this way is that we want to be like Jesus we want to have the kind of character that Jesus has, that we want to do those things that Jesus did because Jesus is our model for what it is to have the kind of character that truly loves and offers grace to the world. And this is not always an easy thing, and sometimes it, it takes our whole lives to cultivate. There's never this moment where we, where we arrive, and there's never really a, a quick shortcut to it. And throughout all the scriptures, we see all these examples of 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 these great biblical heroes and how they cultivated their character. For, for Moses, it tells us that he was a shepherd in the wilderness for 40 years. And that prepared Moses for that time in which he would lead God's people for 40 years in the wilderness. And then later we see that, that David was anointed king and it took 20 years before he actually became king. But in the midst of those 20 years, David also was a shepherd. He was protecting his flocks from bears and lions. And, and, and David was a musician and a warrior and a poet and all of those things shaped who he was. So that when the time came and he became king, he had the character for being a king. We also see this even with Paul as he's writing to Timothy that, that as Paul persecuted the church when he had his encounter with Christ, that it, he says that he spent three years 
and training and in study and meditation and learning what it is to really follow Jesus before he even went and started his first church and introduced other people to Jesus. And one of my favorite stories is in Genesis, and it, and it goes from like 13 chapters from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50, but you have the story of Joseph, who's the youngest of 12 brothers, and he gets this, this coat, and sometimes we, we know it's this coat of many colors, but it's also this long sleeve or maybe this striped coat that his father gives him, and it really is a coat that says to him that he has a privileged position in the family. And of course, it goes to Joseph's head and he has these dreams in which his whole family is bowing down to them and in typical fashion he goes and tells his family how they're all going to bow down to him in this dream that he has and and I love this because even his father says even me and your mother are bowing down and he's like oh yeah that's the way it happened in my dream right and so of course his brothers don't really like that about him and appreciate that so much and so they plot to kill him as you might expect from an Old Testament story and so what they ended up doing they spared his life but they sold him into slavery and what I like about this story is that for most of us as we're cultivating our characters, that oftentimes it feels more like Joseph's story. Because for the next 13 years, Joseph is in slavery and then in prison. And when he seemingly gets an opportunity to get out of prison, he tells somebody, remember me when you go and you talk to the king and remember who helped you out and, and helped you to get out of prison yourself. But then that person goes and forgets all about him. And I could just see myself, if I was in Joseph's position, saying, God, why have you left me here? Why should I continue down this path? Because it doesn't seem to be helping. It doesn't seem to put me in good positions. It doesn't seem to be really what I should do. But yet, it says that Joseph continued to be faithful and to trust God. And everyone saw that in him. And so Joseph was eventually promoted within his household that he was a slave to. And then when he was in prison, he was promoted within prison until eventually when he became in service to the king, he became second in command and he was able to help his people when the drought came. And when he had that moment where he could get revenge, he chose not to do it. Because even in those difficult moments, he learned what it is to have the character and have a heart like God. And God continued to be faithful to him. And as we see in our final clip, this is what Peter learns. As Tony takes the suit away, that Peter begins to dig back into his life and rejoins high school, joins his clubs, goes to his homecoming dance. But then as he encounters the vulture, he decides he needs to go after him, not to prove that he can be somebody, but because it's the right thing to do. And in a moment, in the final battle, he even saves the vulture's life. And because of all that, Peter gets the invitation that he's been waiting for this whole time. In Philippians 4, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and Paul is writing from prison, and he has this to say, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. You see, for each and every one of us today, our lives are based on our decisions and these moments that we live. They're based on our character that comes out. And that is what the world sees. The world sees our lives and our speech and our demeanor and who we love in our faith and in our integrity. And when they look at us, I believe they will see Jesus, when we find that heart of being content, we're willing to say, no matter the circumstances, I know what it is to have plenty, I know what it is to have want, but I know the secret, that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So today, whatever season you might be in, whether you would say, 
I find myself in this place of being young and having these responsibilities and having people look to me or, or I'm a parent and I know that my children are looking to me or I'm a grandparent and, or maybe as a coworker that there are people that are looking to my life or, or whatever, we're, we're in a season of, of maybe even of want. I believe today that if you would lean into that strength of Christ, if you would say, God, I'm offering to you my emptiness today, will you fill it? God, I'm offering you today my life, my example, will you fill it? God, in these places where where I seem to mess up, Lord, give me the strength to keep at it because I know that you won't give up on me and so I won't give up on you. And those that look upon my life will see the salvation that you're offering to me And I will know that love and that grace that you're offering to me today in this moment. Because I believe if we will have that kind of posture, then you will know and experience the grace God is offering to you right now. Will you pray with me? God, today as we gather in this place that we come from, different seasons of our lives, different places on our journey. But God, my prayers is that we come with open hands, ready to receive from you, ready to be honest and open with our lives and to say, God, that we need you, that none of us have arrived, that we are all in need of your grace. And God, you are so faithful and you never give up on us and you offer us grace abundant overflowing grace that meets us wherever we are that meets us wherever we are today so God I pray that we are open to you that we offer before you our emptiness and that God you would fill us with your life and with your love. Lord, in those places where our faith falls short, Lord, may your faith help us to see your heart. Lord, in those places where we've messed up, we've fallen short, we've said things we shouldn't have said, Lord, may we know your forgiveness. And Lord, above all of that, may we have a love of you and others so that we would know your heart and all that you're doing. So Lord, may we say yes to you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 